my family, I mean, they did pretty well, right? Like I didn't come from like a, a poor family or like an insanely rich family or anything like that. We had the luxuries that we were able to, you know, own a home and take a vacation or a few vacations every year. But um, like how that was passed down to me was more traditional, I guess. So even though we kind of had those luxuries, there wasn't like a financial education that they really taught me about it. You know, it was, it's one of those things that I learned primarily about, I guess, our financial situation, mostly by comparing to like my peers and being like, oh, well, you know, my parents have a newer car. These people have a older car, right? Or like, oh, we're able to go on vacation. They're not. Or like, these other people are able to go on a lot of vacations. They must make more money. And that's mostly, I guess, what my financial picture looked like growing up. Um, and then a lot of the, I guess, like business side of finance and, you know, the concepts of passive income and, you know, wealth generation, all those things I actually learned myself as I got into adulthood, but it wasn't really a big part of my childhood. And as far as like in the, in the house, was it, traditional work that your parents were doing? Was there any kind of entrepreneurialness that you, that you could have picked up from them or family members? Yeah, a little, I guess. So my dad owned a business, right? He had a travel business. And I actually think that, um, even though I wasn't super privy to a lot of stuff he was doing, the drive for financial independence kind of came from him running that because he had this travel business that, um, he ran remotely. This is, you know, back in the nineties, way before it was cool before the internet. And so I grew up in Montana and my dad's business was actually based out of New Zealand where he was from. Um, and so he managed it across the world. He had an office there and then he moved to the United States after he met my mom and she was American. And so he, you know, had this flexibility because he had built his business and his life sort of that way. And that's one of the reasons we were able to travel and do these other things was not only did their business do pretty well and did he have these connections through a travel business, but he also kind of could. And I mean, I remember doing uh, doing things like being in Europe and the other stuff with my parents and my dad having to go and take work calls. And, you know, this is like in the late nineties, right? So he had to go and like find a booth and like pay for the long distance calls and like do all the stuff. And he'd be doing work and he was basically digital nomading, but minus the digital part because it didn't exist yet. <laughs> and so with that being said, what did you expect your life to look like? Did you go to college? Were you expecting mm -hmm. to have some sort of career? Um, obviously it probably ended up a little bit different than what you were anticipating, but what, what was that original plan? Yeah. So, you know, despite that upbringing, I guess the expectation was always that I would go a more traditional path. So going up through school, you know, I started doing like college prep stuff at an early age, like everyone did, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, and started touring colleges when I was a sophomore in high school. And the drive and push from my parents was always to, you know, work hard, get into a good school, get a high paying degree. And that's what you would do. And I never wanted to do that, right? But it was just the direction they kind of pushed me. And I mostly went along with it just because I didn't have like a good alternative, right? Like my going, going through that phase of my life, I, you know, played a lot of video games. I had like a handful of friends, not very many friends. Um, you know, we, I played soccer and I skied. And besides that, like I didn't have a lot of like work ethic or ambition or interests on things that were actually, you know, marketable back then, you know, now I could probably, you know, try to be like a streamer. That's what all the kids do, but that wasn't even a thing in, you know, the early two thousands. Right. Um, so I was always going forward with that path and pretty much what it looked like was, is I had to go through all this process to get accepted, trying to accept all these schools. The first school that I got accepted to, I was like, cool, that's where I'm going. I didn't even bother applying anywhere else. I just pretty much wanted my parents to stop pestering me about it. So I got accepted um, at Gonzaga University, which is here in, in Spokane, Washington, where I live now. And that's where I went. And when I went to school, I declared for an engineering degree, mostly just because I was good at math and science in high school. And I knew that it would pay well. And uh, that's what I stuck with going through school, really. Um, and my ultimate goal was to just gut it out and get through school so that I could get into the workforce and start making money. And throughout that whole period of time, you know, I hated pretty much every part of the engineering aspect of it. I liked <laughs> the school part was fine, but the engineering part I hated. And, uh, you know, I was expecting to like it once I got into the workforce. And of course, you graduate, you start working, and that's not what happens. But yeah, so that's uh, that was the trajectory to get to my first job. 
So let's unpack that bit a little bit when you're talking about entering the workforce. What kind of career did you end up in? Um, If you're comfortable, maybe like how much money were you making? And also, I think it's always interesting to get a vibe for were you like a saver at that point? Was finance even on top of your mind at all? Or was it just like, hey, I've just busted my tail for a few years. Let's spend some of this money that I'm making now. Yeah. So um, the first so I graduated from high school in um, 2009. Okay. And then I graduated from college in 2013. And so in that period of time, that was right after the recession, right? So the whole workforce was kind of funny. And even when I graduated from college, it was pretty limited, like the number of opportunities that were out there. And I was very fortunate in the way that I was able to get a job right outside, right out of college, right? So I got a um, consulting engineering job at a company out in Seattle. And I ended up moving out there. I was making 60, no, actually it was $58,000 a year um, to start. And, uh, you know, moved out there and did all that. And the funny thing was, is I've always been relatively simple, I guess, with my ambitions and um, not sorry with my ambitions, with my uh, needs and my wants and my day-to-day life. So I was making 58 grand a year. I moved out there by myself. I had a girlfriend who was a um, now wife who was a year younger than me. So she stayed in college and it was just me in like my little 700 square foot apartment that was way less than I made. Right. I, my main hobbies were going to the gym and playing video games. And that was what I did for like a whole year. And I just like (laughs) saved a bunch of money and didn't do a whole lot of stuff. Right. I made friends through the gym and those sort of things. But even then everyone was pretty simple. I do outdoor activities. So, um, I would say that was one of the original places though that I started to get introduced to financial independence, mostly just from talking to some of the older people there. Um, particularly I had a few coworkers that were like in their late thirties and early forties that were slightly disgruntled, I guess, with their work career. And they were starting to getting into buying rental properties and buying dividend stocks and doing things like that. And so when I originally started investing, when I was there with a lot of my surplus money, I would just pile into the market. Um, and you know, I would just be buying whatever stocks they said were good. Cause I didn't really know any better, but that was sort of my original, um, introduction to wealth generation, um, as I started to make my own money. So this is kind of a cool way to learn about financial independence. I don't know if we've had someone on the show before where they had like two coworkers who were in their late thirties. They're like, yo dude, like screw this work thing. We're trying to get out of here. Like, how does that yeah. even happen? Do they just pull you aside as the new 20 something in the office and tell you about their grand plan, their great escape? Well, kind of. So it, electrical engineering was, was my primary degree. Right. And I, I emphasize the electrical part because there's a lot of young people who get into like civil engineering and software engineering, things like that. But electrical engineering is, was a funny career because there was a huge generation gap in the workforce. So there was a ton of guys that were in like their fifties and sixties. Um, and then there was a bunch of guys that were in like their, I would say like mid thirties. And then there was nobody that was younger than that at all. So even in my graduating class, the total engineering class from GU, I want to say was like 400 people. And there was 13 of us that were electrical engineers, right? So proportionally very, very small. And so when I got there, those two people that I hung out, that I met, they were the other like young bucks at work, right? Even though they were 15, 18 years older than me or if not a little bit more, right? So we would hang out, you know, eat lunch together, you know, go to the gym, you know, during lunch and those sort of things. And gradually those conversations just start to come up. Um, And you know how it is too, when you have people that are into investing in financial independence and they're excited about it, they want to tell other people. (laughs) Oh yeah. And, you know, and I think that they, and I mean, because I do this now, you vicariously start to see the people that are younger than you. And you're like, man, if I was your age, this is what I would do. And this is what I wish someone had told me. So I'm going to tell you this right now. And so it was really organic. And I would say, I don't think I realized how much that impacted me for another six or seven years when I really started to pursue um, financial independence and wealth generation really heavily. Yeah, that's just about what I was about to ask is like, how well did you like accept that message? At at what point did you actually start? Do you feel like making real moves towards between just I happen to be someone who doesn't have a lavish lifestyle and I've, I've got some excess in my spending to a real intentionalness around trying to to retire? Yeah, so I, that didn't really come around um, until actually I was in my second job. So I was at that first job. I was there for about two years. Um I ultimately ended up quitting that job 
mostly like I guess I started shopping around because I got into this whole situation where it was like new it was New Year's and the entire office was like going to get a drink. It was New Year's Eve, you know, whatever before the holiday. And so I clocked out of work like an hour early and I just like said that I was there on my timesheet and you know went out with everybody including my boss to go there. And when I got back to work after the New Year's, my boss called me into his office and gave me a mad lecture about how I'm like stealing money from the company and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, bro, you, you invited me to come with you. You want me to just like <laughs> sit here by myself? He's like, you should have planned ahead and like made up for it in the morning. I was like, you know, anyway. So that was my first, um, I guess, introduction to the whole concept people say of like, your workplace does not necessarily care about you, right? It is a business. And no matter how good of a relationship you have with your boss or the other people in the company, they're going to take the company first, right? And so I ended up shopping around for a different job. I got a job at Boeing um, about three months later, which was an immediate 35% pay increase, right? So I went from making, I was like 62,000 a year at that point to it was like 78 or 80,000, whatever it was. Um, and so I got there. I was so excited for that job because that was like the goal place to work in the area. Like if you got a job at Boeing with my degree, you were set, you know, fat benefits, huge pay upside, you know, super cushy work for uh, work life um, sort of schedule. And then I walked into that office and I I realized within the first 15 minutes that I'd made a mistake. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that, it was, that, it was, that it was not what I thought it was going to be. Like I'm, I always remember walking in there and it was just like cubicle farm, you know, seventies soulless gray cubicles, man. And you could hear a pin drop in there. It was dead silent. And the whole room just had an aura of misery and depression. And it was terrible. Uh, I'm like, and I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating people that work at Boeing, especially in like some of the facilities that aren't like cutting edge, like you're doing cool stuff, like the cities that actually hold the, the place that actually hold the company together are really rough places to work, man. So I started working there and I realized very quickly that I had an insane amount of free time um, in my work day. So what I would do is just start Googling, how can I make more money? And at that point I started getting really into financial independence and I was like, like, like old school financial independence. So I need to save 80% of my income and eat bulk rice and do nothing and just invest as much as I can. If I do that for the next 17 years, then maybe I'll be able to retire off the 4% rule. Right. <laughs> and so that's when I started to get really heavily into investing and just like saving as much money and being frugal. So up to that point, you were just investing in, I know you mentioned individual stocks that the, that the mm -hmm. dudes at the first company were investing in. Were you doing like the index fund thing? Were you investing in just like total stock market stuff? And I guess how long was that period until you made the pivot to what we're going to talk about a lot today is like real estate and finding discounted deals and how that kind of changed everything for you. Yeah. So that was quite a bit later. So I started mostly in index funds. And then as I would kind of like do the math, I would be like, this is going to take forever. So I started doing silly stuff, you know, like day trading weekly options and, you know, basically gambling. Right. And then I, I had a few different forays in trying to um, create different like passive income streams online. So I would do stuff like write affiliate articles and then, you know, try to like push traffic to those. I tried to do like a little drop shipping thing for a really short while. And then I had some life stuff that happened. Um, I had a, a pretty bad family emergency where my dad had a stroke um, and was in the ICU for six weeks. Um, and uh, me and my mom, we lived out of the hospital um, down in Southern California where he had a stroke for six weeks. And during that whole period of time, um, I just got calls multiple times a day from Boeing asking why I wasn't at work, even though I cleared it with my boss. And they basically were just hounding me, um, threatening me with, with, action if I didn't return to the office, which I, you know, didn't do for a while. Um, so that put me in a bad spiral of depression, ended up leaving Seattle, mostly just to change setting and moving back here to Spokane, um, where I, uh, worked at a different job out here, did that for a year. And then ultimately after a year, I actually liked working at that company. It was a good place to work. Um, but I just realized that the nine to five, sort of lifestyle on the Saturday lifestyle was not for me. Um, so 2018, I quit. Um, and I just decided that I was going to do anything else and try to figure it out. Real estate at that point wasn't even on the map. 
but I was lucky in the way that I had been saving a huge amount of money for the previous five years. So I had a pretty healthy 401k, I had a pretty healthy savings account. Um, and I just said, cool, I'm going to quit, live off of my, at that point, wife's um, income. We cut all of our luxury spending that we had in our budget down to zero and basically just lived off of as frugal of a budget as we could. And I just went to work trying to find what I was going to do. Um, and real estate actually didn't come around even for about another year after that. So um, I can go into some more details with that or I can jump ahead. I'm not sure where you guys want to go with it. Well, yeah, when you're making that decision to to step away, I mean, that's a, that's a huge decision when you don't have something to step into. Like you're making that yeah. decision, you know, not knowing exactly what's going to be. You just know you want to find something. Did you give yourself like, kind of a self-contract, like I'm going to give myself three months, a year to figure this out. And this is what success looks like in terms of if I can do this, then I don't have to go back to nine to five. I'm just curious, like mentally, what was the, what went through your mind when you're making that decision and how did you convince yourself that it was going to be okay? Yeah. Um, honestly, I think that I was able to convince myself it was going to be okay with an irrational self-belief. Like I was just confident that if I, you know, knuckle down on something, I would figure it out. Right. And honestly, the hardest part of that whole transition was having to tell my parents what I was doing, especially because they had the expectation of, you know, me going to school and, you know, especially my mom, she used to have a lot of value in being able to like talk to her friends and say, like, Oh, you know, my son's an engineer, like he works at Boeing, he does whatever. And that was a really, really hard conversation. I was very fortunate that my wife was very, very supportive. You know, she, um, I remember when I, I remember when I made the decision, like literally I was driving to work. It was one of those days where like, you're just so not into it that you get in the car and you don't even have music or anything on. And you don't realize that until you're like two thirds of the way, like the, where you're going. You ever have one of those? <laughs> you're just like, man. And I remember I was driving and I was like dead silent. I was like four minutes from my office and I called my wife and I was like, I think I need to quit my job. And she was like, and do what? And I was like, I don't know. She said, well, are you going to be happier? And I was like, probably. She said, okay, cool. That sounds great. Wow. Um, and I, uh, I told my boss that I was going to quit that day. Um, and he was gracious enough, actually. My, that was my boss. He was actually now my business partner, funnily enough. He was one of my best friends from uh, college. He gave me the ability to finish out the year. This was in October. Um, and then I was able to leave in uh, January. And uh, yeah, from there. You know, I just tried to find myself going forward. Um, and like I said, I had I had the backstop. And what I would always tell myself, I guess, was worst case, I could go back to being an engineer, but I didn't really consider that an option. And I was more inclined to just hustle and do anything that I could to make money as opposed to that option, right? So as I was going through that, I made my money through working at a gym that I, I coached CrossFit classes. So I would just make, you know, $25 a class and I would do as many classes as I could a week. And then in the evenings I would drive for Uber eats and I would just deliver, you know, meals to people. But my income went from, I think when I left my last engineering job, I was like 9,800 something thousand right after incentives, um, to $16,000 in 2018. So basically a, you know, 90% drop. <laughs> wow. Okay. So let's dig yeah. into that a bit because that's extremely scary. You're talking about losing a fifth or dropping down to a fifth of your income, making $16,000 in 2018. Were you building any of these, like what I like to call like longer income generation vehicles, like a blog or a YouTube channel or an online course or like some of these things that it takes, it's kind of hockey stick growth, right? Like it takes a lot of time for it to take off or were you just like really trying to find your footing and messing around with all these more active income side hustles like the Uber Eats and the CrossFit classes? Like, were you doing yeah. anything in the background? Did you, were you pulling the any of the master mm -hmm. strings? You had some grand plan like in 2019, you know, all of the fruits of my labor from 2018 are going to, they're going to sprout. Yeah. So when I first left, because I, I, I've competed in like fitness and stuff for a long time. So my original goal was to actually go back to school and get into physical therapy and open a physical therapy clinic because I really enjoyed coaching and, and working with people. But then I worked in a PT clinic for, I don't know, about three weeks. And I'm like, this is just like working at Boeing, except I have to touch old people. And it's even worse. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not doing this either. So I, I backed out of that. And then from that point, I was just trying to like sort of find any niche that was 
somewhat scalable and um, allowed me to have location independence, right? That was honestly my biggest thing was I, I wanted to be location dependent because I had I'd read the four hour work week right before I quit. And I was like, I want that lifestyle of where I can have like my muse and I can focus and I can make it something that is, you know, makes me a large amount of income or makes me reoccurring income. And I can have these like mini retirements throughout my life. So that was always my goal. And so my original intention um, after I uh, left the PT stuff, because like I was trying to figure out how to make that like an online thing as well. So I could like bring the PT clinic online and some sort of stuff, but the barrier to entry was high. And like I said, I didn't like touching old people. So it was weird. Um, so I then got into web development and did different kind of like creative, you know, web-based businesses. So I did a few things with that. I taught myself how to code um, and started, you know, I, I literally locked myself in my office at my house for like three months. And when I wasn't driving for Uber or working at the gym, I was teaching myself how to code. And so I started picking up some like contract work doing that. And then I started selling websites to local companies. And when I learned that you could sell a website to some of these local companies for like three or $4,000, and then I could go and hire someone to make it for like four or $500. I was like, Oh damn, this is pretty cool. Like that was a business. Right. And in that whole process, that's what I that's what I focused on, honestly, from middle of 2018 until early 2020. But in that period of time, I was starting to accumulate some cash, um, and I still recognized that it was very transactional. I had to sell and like market that all the time. There was no reoccurring income, and so through all the books that I would read, real estate was a common thing that would come up in forms of passive income through rental income, right? So I was like, cool, I'm going to get into real estate. I don't want to do any work because I have this web design company I'm trying to build, but you know, they're, they have some new houses kind of close by to where I live. Maybe if I buy some of those, I can just have rental income from that. So I liquidated my corporate 401k, um, you know, paid all the fees and taxes and everyone told me I was so dumb for doing that. But I used that to buy these two single family homes um, that were cut just around the corner. And at the time, you know, I didn't know how to do diligence or anything. So they ended up making way less money than I thought, right? I was like, oh, if they're going to have a $1,200 mortgage, I'll be able to rent them for $1,600. I'll make $400 a month each. Like, this is easy. But of course, I didn't account for vacancy or property management or any kind of maintenance or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I took the leap and jumped in with those and started having a little bit of mailbox money coming in once I got them rented out. And that gave me the itch to start pursuing real estate more aggressively. Um, so I started getting into going to the meetups, listening to bigger pockets, all the sort of stuff people do. And then at one of the meetups, people were talking about flipping houses and these big checks that they were able to get. And I was like, well, if I want more passive income, I need a larger chunk, chunk of money. So I'm going to start flipping houses. So I met somebody who I actually met online and was local to me and they were new and they had money and I had time outside of my digital company that I was trying to build. And so we decided we were going to flip houses together. And that was kind of my initial foray into actually active investing instead of just parking money. When you first started getting into flipping houses, you just mentioned like you just met someone online. Like I think someone could hear that and think that's a, that's a pretty big endeavor to get in with somebody. Like you just made somebody online and decide you're going to go buy the most valuable asset that most people ever get in their lives, which is a home. So, Maybe you could just walk us through how you found this person, how you uh, felt like you could trust someone. And, and again, this is just another example of like you making this leap that I think a lot mm -hmm. of people would hear just like when you quit your job and you're wondering, man, I don't know how I can like, you know, muster up the courage to do something like that. Yeah. Like I said, the main driver for everything I've ever done, honestly, is just a, you know, maybe a blind belief in myself, right? Just irrationally strong, I guess. But um, so I, I met this person on the Bigger Pockets forum. You know, they had responded to a post of from a realtor saying like, hey, are any investors um, active in Spokane? And this girl, she responded and said, yeah, I am. Um, I'm looking to start flipping properties. I ended up DMing her mostly just to network. And we kind of had similar goals. Uh, we were both in the same place starting out. And honestly, it's like misery loves company. We decided to just jump into flipping houses together. And neither of us didn't know what we didn't know, but we both were the same lovely ambition of like, let's just do it and see what happens. So, um, you know, like we did all the proper 
like paperwork and we had agreements and those sort of things. So it wasn't as dicey as you'd expect. And also too, from my end, I mean, she was putting up the money. So like, <laughs> for me, I got, like, I was the one that kind of held the cards at that point. Right. So, yeah. So how did you, con- if she was given all the money, how did you convince her? Were you doing just all the legwork and you were like, Hey, don't worry. I got it. I have no experience whatsoever, but you can trust me. Yeah. It, I mean, honestly, that's a great question. I have no idea. I think, I think we just like, like we just vibed well. Um, and, uh, you know, I met, met her and her husband and we just like started looking at houses kind of together. Cause I had a realtor that I had been looking at and then coincidentally they had been talking to the same realtor. And so that gave like an extra level of trust, I guess there, cause we had already been sort of in the same circle. Um, and also too, I mean, she knew my, background that I had had a decent job in the past. And she already knew that I owned some rentals. Um, and you know, we just decided to give it a go. And back then this was 2018, right? Like late 2018. So it wasn't as challenging to find deals as it is right now. Um, and there weren't as many people in it. So honestly, back then, if you found someone that was you know, had the same sort of like drive and expectations, you didn't quite have to be as cautious about people being, um, I don't know, like negligent with stuff just because there was less people involved. Mm. Right. So law of averages, people are going to put more time and, um, like motivation into these deals because otherwise they wouldn't be there. There wasn't people that were like, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses and get into real estate investing really at that point. So you had the the new houses that you got into first, and then you start getting these flips. It doesn't sound like the evolution stopped there. So, like, where yeah. did that where did that one take you? The slippery slope of real estate. Yeah, the slippery slope. So, first house we flipped, um, and I'll say like that. My whole intention as I was doing this too was to get into buy more rentals, and I recognized the biggest barrier to buy more rentals was capital. Right. So I started hearing about like the Burr method, you know, where you buy and you rehab and you refinance your money out and you can repeat with the same capital. So I want to do that. And so, you know, flipping properties was an avenue to get that capital. The first house that we flipped didn't know we didn't know. After four months and everything going wrong that could have possibly gone wrong, I made about four grand. Right. So in terms of like a, you know, hourly ROI, terrible. In terms of the education that I got, it was absolutely priceless. Right. But I took that initial action from there. We flipped a couple more. I think I got like a $30,000 check, uh, you know, $28,000 check, started making some money. At that point, I bought a duplex, um, that I was able to actually, me and my wife, we bought it ourselves. Um, we were able to actually fix up and, um, refinance out our money on that property, which we then rolled into a triplex and we kind of did the same thing. And, Ultimately, what happened was I uh, started recognizing that I knew the process and it wasn't the capital generation that was necessarily the issue. It was the uh, lead flow. And so I started trying to figure out how I could get more opportunities without having to wait for the market, wait for realtors to bring me things or have to pay wholesalers large assignment fees. Um, Especially on the last deal that we bought the flip together, we paid the wholesale like a $38,000 fee. And I remember seeing the closing statement. I was like, damn, that's $38,000. I feel like should be mine for, um, you know, actually buying this house. So now then the, uh, the focus became, how can I be the person in that position instead of the one that's having to, to pay that amount of money? And so that led me to not necessarily wholesaling the start, but it let us go and direct a seller. So mm-hmm. in, yeah, so in, in late 2019, early 2020, um, I approached my now business partner, um, he was, you know, my, he was my best friend from college and was my boss at that, that last job that I had. And I approached him a, because I kind of needed his money because we had a, a plan, um, for how we, I was going to generate these leads and start finding off market real estate, but it required cash, right. Which I didn't have yet. And so partly that, and then also too, he had an interest in real estate as well. And sometimes when you go into these business endeavors, it's, you feel like you want to have a business partner. You don't have to go it alone. It feels less scary. Um, so, but we started marketing direct to seller. And when we started, our goal was not to wholesale. It was to buy 50 properties over the next 10 years. Um, and then wholesaling came around because as we were going through the process, we recognized that that was one of the fastest ways to generate um, enough cash to be able to keep buying rentals. So 
you know, I have an identity, I guess my main business as a wholesaler now, but that was never the intention when we started. It was always to get passive income. Well, I definitely want to dig into finding discounted deals, but before we hit record here, you were talking about how that's kind of become your bread and butter and Mm -hmm. you can find a discounted real estate property and it could be a long-term rental. It could be a short-term rental. You could wholesale it. You could flip it. Like there's so many different things that you could do if you have the skill set. if you know how to get direct to seller, you can skirt around the MLS. Like I have friends who'll be like, there's no deals. I'm like, oh, like, where are you looking? They're like, you know, once a week on Zillow. It's like, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's going to be pretty tough to find deals that way. So could you maybe just give a quick lay of the land? Like, what do you mean when you're talking about finding deals direct to seller? Like how, how do you get discounted prices that way? Like, how does it work? Yep. So basically what you do is you pull public data that you can access most places. You know, we use a system called PropStream. There's a lot of different places you can pull this data from. And you look for people that have things like recorded bankruptcies. They have liens on their properties. You know, they have code violations with the city, things like that. And then you reach out to them. You know, we do direct mail. Mostly you can call them. You can do whatever you want. And then you engage with them and see if they have a problem that can be solved with by you with basically the house being the collateral, right? So people that like need um, money quickly, make people that have rental properties with a bad tenant that has now turned into a liability for them versus an asset. And what you try to do is you try to buy these houses for 50, 60 cents in the dollar. Um, and the funny thing is too, is there's a lot of stigmas around wholesaling about how it's you know, always like trashy people that you're buying houses from, right? Or it's like, you know, the really poor, unfortunate people, but that's not the case at all. I mean, we've bought houses from people like dentists, from university professors, from other real estate investors that have large portfolios. It's all about if they have a problem that you're able to solve by buying that house at a discount and getting them the money now, or, you know, relieving them of that liability that they've established. And I'm really... You know, it's become our bread and butter, and I'm really passionate about that because that I think is one of the fastest ways that, like, kind of a a nobody, like a one man show, can go and make life changing money and wealth in an extremely quick period of time, right? So when we first started this business, I had my couple rentals that I had worked my tail off to get right. You know, I had saved for five years to buy my first two single families. Um, I had been flipping these houses where I was working like a dog and, you know, really just beating my body up, doing all the stuff to get my duplex and my triplex from those. And then between when we started our direct to seller business um, to when I had reached financial freedom and became a millionaire was nine months. Wow. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, just like it, you, you can't even, and, and the funny thing is, is, people it's a really uncomfortable period of time going through that there's an incredible amount of learning that goes on there's a lot of i would say investment like that feels not like an investment because you're spending it on marketing and business systems it's not necessarily a hard asset but it is a you know a small risk for absolutely asymmetrical upside right and that lead generation like portion of it is so, so important. And so many people just ignore that. And they instead just wait for the opportunity to come into their lap. And that's cool. You can reach financial independence in like a decade, but if you want it like now, you kind of have to put in that extra legwork and it can really pay huge dividends. No, that's a, that's an awesome sounding, you know, you know, way of going about it. And obviously if you can get something for anything for 50, 60 cents on the dollar, that's yeah. a, you know, that, that's a huge advantage in getting out there in front of things before it gets to a, a point like Zillow where everyone's mm-hmm. fighting over it. When you talk about, you know, mailing these people individually, I'm curious if there's things that you've done to make this kind of stand out where it doesn't just look like junk mail coming through. Like when you're doing this, like you said, kind of a smaller operation, are you actually maybe like handwriting notes? Are you doing something to make it where it doesn't look like, oh, this is just another random thing that they've sent to everybody on my block? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start this by saying that when we first started this, it took us a while to figure out what we were doing. And from when we first mailed to when we got our first deal was about six months and we were about $30,000 in the hole at that point. Right. Wow. So that was money that we had spent that we did not know when there was going to be a return on. Um, investment on that, if there ever was going to be, right? And so what we've always done, and and we joined a a group that like taught us a lot of this, is we send um, 
letters, right? For the most part, rather than like cheap postcards, a lot of people will send mailers and they'll send like the 30 cent, like yellow postcards. Of course, people throw it away. It looks like junk mail. What we'll normally do is we'll send letters. They're not necessarily handwritten, but they'll like look printed, things like that in a white envelope that are addressed from a person. Usually it's me or someone on our team. Um, and they'll, uh, you know, so it's like, it looks like a professional letter. So it looks like a personal letter that they got from like a friend or somebody. So our open rate's extremely high. And then on the inside of it, we have a, um, you know, professionally built business logo, a website points to reviews, you know, things like they can go on our website, they can see our faces, they can see who we are. And that instantly allows us to stand out amongst all the people that aren't doing that extra, um, those extra steps in there, but are also against the people that are trying to spend, you know, 30 cents on a letter, we're spending like a dollar and 10 cents on a letter. So we reach less people, but the quality of people that we reach is significantly higher. Um, and so that's like, honestly, the biggest thing that for some reason, people like to skip that. And it can be kind of scary when you're, you know, clicking the order form online with your credit card plugged in, but that's what you got to do if you want to actually stand out. And so what does the conversation typically look like? So you send out these mailers, someone's like, wow, someone took the time to send me this nice handwritten thing. I have no idea what this is. It's from Mike. Oh, cool. I don't know who Mike is, but I'm gonna open this up. They look at it. They're like, you know what? I am having so much trouble with this house. Like I just inherited it or, you know, it has this lean, this mechanics lean on it or a whole slew of other problems. They call you up. They're like, Hey, I'm interested in selling my house. And then what's, what's your pitch? Like, why do, why do they say yes? Yeah. So what we usually have in the mailers, you know, we're not going to tell them why we're mailing them, right? Like we know on our end that they received it because they have a me mechanics lien on the property. But typically what's in the letter is that's like, hey, you know, we're investors, we're looking at buying properties in this neighborhood. Um, you know, this house in particular is interesting to us, you know, give us a call if you're interested in selling. Hmm. And then with the customer story too, and this is why I like direct mail versus like cold calling. They have taken the time, they've received the letter, they've opened it up, they've picked up their phone, they've decided to call us. Okay. And typically there's there's you know four different responses you get, right? You get the person that tells you to go after yourself. You're always gonna have those, right? <laughs> you get the you, you get the person that calls in and says, um, you know, I want a million dollars for my house. Okay. You get a person that calls in and says, like, I might want to sell, but like, what's your deal? And they're kind of skeptical. And then you have the people that call in and basically just like spill all their dirty laundry. Right. So the go after yourselves, we usually ignore the rest of them. What it comes down to the conversation is gathering information and trying to just like hear what their story is and getting to know them as a person. Um, and this is somewhere that I think a lot of people that get involved in this business get lost because they start the business because they're interested in real estate, but at its core, it's not a real estate business. It's a marketing and sales business. And so what you need to be able to do is look past the asset that you're interested in, past the property, and instead get to them as a person. And so we usually go through a whole script where we ask them, you know, why they're looking to sell to us versus a realtor, you know, what's the condition of the house, when do they want to sell it and all these sort of things. And then you go through that process for long enough and eventually people will start to tell you the real situation about why they reached out. You know, keeping in mind that you know that they have something going on because that's why you mailed them because they were on these lists. And then after that, it just becomes a numbers game, right? Where you talk to enough people, you ultimately find people that have enough of a situation that they need to sell. Um, and then, you know, you can bail them out of whatever they're dealing with at that point in time. And, you know, sometimes it happens very quick. Sometimes it takes a long time. We've had some people that were in our system for years before we got them signed around, before they were willing to sell to us. We've had other people that from when they called into when we have a signed contract is three hours, right? It just, it wow. varies an incredible <laughs> amount. Um, and the thing that's, that's really interesting about this business as well is um, what you get paid on the wholesale side. And this is why it's so powerful compared to being like a realtor. What you get paid is not um, tied necessarily to the value of the property, right? So we've made, we've made fees as high as a hundred thousand dollars off of houses that are worth like 300, 400 grand, right? Because we've gotten in at such a massive discount because of conditions of the property. Um, or if there's like an extra development opportunity, things like there, we've also had fees as low as like $2,000 on like half million dollar houses. Right? So it's all about how you can negotiate the deal and what sort of situation you're hoping the person get out of right that or like what sort of development opportunities are there so it's all about learning to identify that when you're 
moving the properties. So to, you're using like an interesting word to me in this situation. You're saying fees. So like for those maybe listening who aren't familiar yeah. with this, like functionally what's going on? Like the person is getting ready, is ready to sell it and so you're not making a profit. You're not like taking and out, buying it from them and selling it to someone else. You are, you know, brokering a transaction to someone else. And that is the fee you're charging to the ultimate oh, yeah. owner. Is that what's sorry. going on or? Yeah, sorry. I, I should probably explain what wholesaling even is. Um, <laughs> so it's one of, sometimes you get in these things where you're just like, or it's so second nature to you. So basically what wholesaling is, is you get a contract to buy a property with a seller for say $200,000. Um, let's say the house is worth 350,000. You get the contract for 200,000. You go and you find another investor or another buyer who was willing to buy that property for $210,000. And without actually closing on the property, you do what's called an assignment of contract, where you basically, the, the person, the end buyer pays you $10,000 for the right to buy the contract that you hold equitable interest in. So it's a it's almost like, day trading with real estate, honestly, because it's very fast. Um, and you know, there's always a lot of moving parts that have to come together really quickly, but what it allows you to do is make very large amounts of money without having to go through the process of closing on the property, getting a loan, fixing it up, you know, having holding costs, like hard money costs, any of those sort of things, you can instead just make kind of the quick buck, which will be less than if you flip the house, but it takes three weeks instead of three months. You don't have to risk anything with the actual property on the market. So um, yeah, and fees can vary an incredible amount depending on the opportunity that you're able to find. Just off that, what, what happens if you've got that contract from the seller, but then you actually don't end up finding someone else who's willing to take on mm -hmm. that contract? Yep. Are you so obligated in any way or is that something you can walk away from? So um, it's just like a traditional real estate contract, right? You, we have non-refundable earnest money that goes down. So if we fail to close, then they'll get the earnest money. Um, this is where the ethics of, of wholesaling comes into question regularly, right? And how people treat this depends on them as, as a person, right? So there's some people that will have these funky escape clauses and things like that in their contract to let them back out at any time. I mean, we don't do that. We usually have earnest money between 500 to a thousand dollars. We also don't typically lock up contracts if we aren't very confident that we're able to move them because, you know, you don't want people getting into a situation where they've like started to move out of the house and then you're not able to perform. Um, so that's been a big thing that we've always, um, you know, tried to do with our business, but also too, one thing I'll say is still going back we wholesaled to generate this revenue, but we still bought an incredible number of properties, right? So between when we did our first deal in um, March of 20, I'm sorry, May of 2020 through when the market kind of started to turn over in early 2022, um, I added 53 properties to my portfolio, right? Um, in that very short period of time, we were able to do that because we were buying at such a massive discount that we could just recycle the capital. And so if we got these properties that we couldn't move for some reason, we just buy them and we just add them to the portfolio. Right. And so like, sometimes you would have to stretch and like take out, get private money and things like that to do it. But we always made sure that we had that as a backup plan in case we weren't able to sell the contract. And when you're getting these, when you're getting these properties at 50 or 60 cents in the dollar, like it's a home run, no matter what you do with it, whether you turn it into a rental property or an Airbnb or whatever, like, you already have exactly. that built-in equity cushion, which is just so huge. Because even if mm -hmm. you could do like a cash out refi and then you have some money that you can then deploy to buy another, like there's just so many possibilities when you're getting these upfront with such large discount. I feel that's a part of real estate that we haven't really focused on much in this podcast. Like we've had so many real estate investors that you know make money, we, but we mostly talk about once you acquire the property and on the back end mm -hmm. in that process. But yeah, going and doing the dirty work and getting these properties up front at a 50 or 60% discount. I do want to kind of just paint a realistic picture though for listeners, because we might have some people yeah. who are like, oh, this sounds awesome. Like I'm gonna go get a list of 10 people, send up mailers, like definitely gonna get one of them and make a bunch of money. What's the type of volume that you're pumping out, Mike? Like how many mailers are you sending out for responses? And then, you know, responses to closes. Like I'm guessing it's a lot that you're sending out. Yeah, so our average cost per um, deal that we close is about $3,800. 3,800, right? so what is that comprised of? Yeah, so in that, that that's about 3,500 mailers per deal closed. Um, and that is with us right now having a refined sales and marketing um, and follow-up process, right, with all these people. When we first started, that number was closer to 5,000. 
dollars um, per deal, right? And that's kind of the realistic expectation that we tell people to have, like when people reach out to me and they want to get started and they're like, I have $1,000, I'm going to start marketing for deals. What should I do? I always say, go make some more money. Like, honestly, <laughs> go, go drive for Uber, go like, you know, pick up side hustles, go be a task rabbit, go do whatever you can. Because if you start getting into this with a thousand dollars, regardless of what a lot of the other influencers on, you know, Instagram and stuff will tell you, you are going to have a really difficult time being successful purely because you're not going to generate enough opportunities. Right. And the thing is, too, sure, you might be able to find something, but you're also competing with the people like me that are doing this at a level that is much more sophisticated, that has a brand that has a bunch of five star reviews on Google. Right. And you need to be able to have more numbers if you're going to do that. Um, so that's a realistic expectation. But our average fee is twenty seven and a half thousand. Right. So our average return on ad spend is what's that five and a half. So it's you know, very, very worthwhile. And the crazy thing is, is how regular that return is that even now we've been doing this for coming up on, I guess what three, well, I guess over three and a half years at this point, and it'll fluctuate up and down a little bit, but we have ever since we started closing stuff, it has been consistent, you know, 27 and a half thousand, five and a half return on ad spend. Um, and it's, it's worked out really well for us. What about different markets for something like this? Is this something that doesn't really matter where you are, where you're targeting, or would it, could somebody benefit from maybe targeting an area that they're really familiar with? You know, I'm thinking about myself, right? Like I'm from a small town in Mississippi. There may not be as many people targeting this random town from Mississippi. There's enough people there though, who might be in this situation. Like, is that a play or are you doing this across the country? Just you know, what should someone expect, especially maybe thinking about somebody who's first getting into it? Like what kind of square mileage are they targeting? What kind of markets? Like what are the attributes that market should have? Yeah. So um, from our from our perspective, so when the market started to turn in early 2022, we, we kind of saw it coming. Our biggest red flag was we we had these like little lake cabins. I use cabins sort of generously that we flipped that were here in Spokane. They were like 300 square feet. They look like a shed from Lowe's <laughs> and they were across the street from a lake. And we sold these things for 300 grand a piece. Okay. And as soon as we sold those, both me and Dan Bismarck, we were like, this is bad. We need to get out of this market. <laughs> it's it's going to crash. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no way this is sustainable. And so, so we started going national. Right. And, you know, really leaning into the virtual style business. Um, and we started marketing in, in different places around the country. So first we started in Knoxville. Um, then we started doing some stuff in like the outer, outer Chicago area. Um, and the markets we would pick were mostly just based off of we knew people there and we would JV with them, we'd partner with them. Um, so since then, fast forward, we now expanded. We're currently active in 20 different markets, right? That we found like good little niches. And the best markets that we have found are typically those small markets, hmm. right? Mostly because there's less competition. Um, with the exception being if you're in a market where houses are like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, right? There's some of those really cheap markets that you find in the Midwest. Those are not very fruitful, mostly just because there's not enough meat to make any money. You know, a roof costs $8,000 in an expensive market as well as a cheap market. And if the house is only worth 40 grand, the house is basically underwater. Um, but so we actually do some decent stuff in Mississippi with one of our partners there um, in a in a town that's, I don't know, I think a hundred something thousand people, right? It's pretty small. Um, we've done stuff in, like in Montana in several markets out there with towns that are 60,000 people, right? Um, and the criteria that you just need is, are there rental properties there? Right. And are there people that are actively looking to invest in real estate there? And a lot of people try to go to these markets where there's like huge populations, there's a huge investor presence. Honestly, if you want to do this business, you only need like three or four buyers. Right. You just need the, and you, in fact, it's almost better because then you can find what their buying criteria is. You can go and find properties that meet their criteria and just sell to them. And your business is significantly easier than if you're trying to compete with all these people in these huge markets. Makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, Mike, I'm sure we could talk to you about wholesaling for multiple hours. You are a wealth of knowledge. You're constantly putting out a bunch of good content. I follow you on Instagram, love seeing your stuff there. But for those listeners who are interested in wholesaling, real estate in general, your story, what you got going on, where is the best place or places for them to connect and get in touch? 
Yeah. So if you want to reach out to me directly, the best is on Instagram, stepmike underscore invest. Um, I post a lot of con- content there about the stuff that we're working on and about real estate um, as a whole. And if you want to hear more about our business and kind of like the specifics of wholesaling and how we run our business, you can check out my podcast. It's called the Collecting Keys Podcast. It's available anywhere. Um, and we have interviews there with other people that are professional investors. We do a business facing show on Wednesday. That's me and my co-host talking. And then we do like a kind of like a Q and a show on Fridays. Where we'll answer a show from a listener. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the best ways. And I guess what I'll, what I'll leave people with too, is I get a lot of people that reach out that say that they want the opportunities, but they don't want to be a wholesaler and learn the tactics, but just don't do it with like a wholesale mindset. Right? Like even if all you want to do is buy two or three properties a year, if you're able to buy two or three properties at a 50% discount, that's much better than waiting to buy two or three properties on, on the market at like full price. Right. You know, even if it costs you money to get there, you know, it's, it's going to be absolutely worth your while. And it's going to really, um, like expedite your, uh, steps to getting to financial freedom. You know, there's, you know, there's a, it's just math after a while, right? If you get a $500,000 property for $300,000, that's two hundred thousand dollar increase in your net worth right there. It's that simple. Well, Mike, thanks so much for giving us some time. This is a really you know cool topic, a different part of real estate that we haven't covered as much, and it's also just impressive, you know, to hear some of the the, the big leaps that you took and the self belief that that took. Um, again, appreciate you giving us some time, and I know the listeners are going to love this one. Awesome, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.